Hey, I'm Damon Garcia giving you perspectives from the Christian left. And today we're in the last part going through Rosa Luxemburg's document, Socialism and the Churches. And in this last part, we're going to talk about the Christian left's role if a revolution comes. Let's get into it. So, like I said, this is part seven, the last part. If you haven't seen any of the other videos, go to the link in the description, watch the other parts first. This is the conclusion to the whole series. So, part seven, let's get into this. A few final words. The clergy has at its disposal two means to fight social democracy. Where the working class movements is beginning to win recognition, as is the case in our country, Poland, where the possessing classes still hope to crush it. The clergy fights the socialists by threatening sermons, slandering them, and condemning the covetousness of the workers. And that's so messed up to think about. To condemn poor people for wanting what others have. When it's like, yo, they're poor because of the social structure that you're supporting. Anyway. But in the countries where political liberties are established and the Workers' Party is powerful, as for example in Germany, France, and Holland, there the clergy seeks other means. It hides its real purpose and does not face the workers any more as an open enemy, but as a false friend. Thus you will see the priests organizing the workers and launching Christian trade unions. And this way, they try to catch the fish in their net to attract the workers into the trap of these false trade unions, where they teach humility, unlike the organizations of the social democracy which have in view struggle and defense against maltreatment. So these churches see these trade unions starting and say, we'll start our own, but instead of teaching people to try to change things, we'll teach them humility and acceptance of how things are. Man. She continues, when the Tsarist government finally falls under the blows of the revolutionary proletariat of Poland and Russia, and when political liberty exists in our country, then we shall see the same Archbishop Popiel and the same ecclesiastics who today thunder against the militants, suddenly beginning to organize the workers into Christian and national associations in order to mislead them. Already we are at the beginnings of this underground activity of the national democracy, which assures the future collaboration with the priests and today helps them to slander the social democrats. The workers must therefore be warned of the danger so that they will not let themselves be taken in on the morrow of the victory of the revolution by the honeyed words of those who today from the heights of the pulpit dare to defend the czarist government which kills the workers, and the repressive apparatus of capital, which is the principal cause of the poverty of the proletariat. So this is what we've been saying. Like, the church should always be on the side of the poor and the oppressed, just like Jesus commanded his followers to be, and a church to be consistently on the side of the oppressors, just to save face, I guess, is ridiculous. So we continue, in order to defend themselves against the antagonism of the clergy at the present time during the revolution and against their false friendship tomorrow after the revolution, it is necessary for the workers to organize themselves in the Social Democratic Party. Now here's the last paragraph, and I love this. And here is the answer to all the attacks of the clergy. The social democracy in no way fights against religious beliefs. On the contrary, it demands complete freedom of conscience for every individual and the widest possible toleration for every faith and every opinion. But from the moment when the priests use the pulpit as a means of political struggle against the working classes, the workers must fight against the enemies of their rights and their liberation. For he who defends the exploiters and who helps prolong this present regime of misery he is the mortal enemy of the proletariat, whether he be in a cassock or in the uniform of the police. Or of a priest. So, that is Socialism in the Churches by Rosa Luxemburg. And I want to end this whole thing by saying, like I read that last paragraph and I see it as Rosa saying, the revolution is coming. The workers aren't gonna allow this kind of treatment for long and they're gonna rise up. And when that happens, 
you, church, are you going to be on their side? Because if you're not, then you're going to be one of the several that they take down with the other oppressive systems. Yeah. And I feel the same applies today. People aren't going to allow injustice for long. People are going to rise up and try to change things. And like I said in the last video, I very much believe the reason the revolutionary left exists is because the church hasn't done its job, hasn't actually fulfilled the calling of Jesus and of the early apostles have become complacent and have chosen the side of the oppressors again and again and again all throughout Christian history. So, as Christians, as Jesus followers, we should be sympathetic to the desires of the revolutionary left. And I think we have something to offer following Jesus who desired very similar things. And also as Christians, I feel like we can help the revolution get going and make sure it doesn't involve killing landlords and throwing everyone we disagree with in gulags and eating the rich. <laughs> and I know some leftists out there think, well, without all that, revolution is impossible. Without violence and killing the oppressors, it's impossible for our revolution. It's impossible for anything to change. But maybe if the Christians were actually helping you, it wouldn't be impossible. If the Christians were on the side of the revolution, maybe the revolution would be possible without massive killings. That's just complete guess and speculation. But more than anything, I say Christians need to stop and reflect on who we've become and who we're called to be and reignite within us that radical faith that Jesus taught, the faith that leads us to believe that we actually can change the world, that we actually can put an end to systems that oppress the poor and the downtrodden, oppress the people that Jesus consistently said of, hey, whatever you do for them, you do for me. And like I've said, Rosa Luxemburg was a Jewish atheist, and I've found in my other readings of atheists how it's so interesting that when they critique Christianity, so often they wind up helping us. Helping us see things that we couldn't see because we're clinging too hard on our own tradition. But when someone from outside is able to deconstruct the whole thing and look at it from their critical perspective, it can help us see things that we're not able to. Especially, so many atheists have written things about, hey, shouldn't Christians be more like Jesus? And at times, they're able to do it way better than any Christian has been able to. So that, that was another goal of reading this whole thing, is going through something that would be a critique to your faith in order to strengthen your faith. So that's socialism and the churches. Hopefully it gave you something to think about. Leave a like if you liked the video. Leave a comment. Tell me what you think. Let's talk about this stuff. I think this is a conversation we all need to be having way more of amongst Christians, amongst leftists, amongst people in general who care about the world getting better. Thank you so much for going through this with me. Thank you, Rosa Luxemburg, for writing this. And I'll see you in another video.